Hello everybody, welcome to my workshop, Dramatic Logo. Um, <laughs> today's stream is brought to you by a really cheap, nasty 7-Eleven coffee. Because none of the, uh, none of the um, gas stations in my area carry the caffeinated fizzy water that I like anymore. So I didn't want to spend five dollars in a Starbucks, so I just got a little bit of this. So. Not sponsored by 11 Sevens. What's going on, everybody? I want to start going over um, not just dioramas, but actual miniature items with you guys. I share a lot of things in my shorts, and in my, I have things for sale in my Etsy store, and I do some individual items and stuff when I do dioramas, but I wanted to do start mixing in both uh, for all of you out there, because I know a lot of you want to know how to do this stuff or don't know how to start doing this stuff um, or some of you have seen it but haven't tried it uh, or have done lots of it and wouldn't mind seeing another way to do it. So as always, this is art in real time where we do art in real time. If this is your first time watching one of these streams, thank you for being here and all of you who have been here and all of you who are channel members, thank you for coming back. Um, appreciate you very much. And. Uh, yeah, as I typically try to do, especially with these live streams now, I'm trying to focus on whatever I do, at least the first types of things I do, I try to make it as informative and accessible as possible to anyone in any situation, whether like circumstantial or financial, like meaning, you know, not everybody has a, a good workshop space that's like good size like mine, not everybody has access to power tools you know, stuff like that. So I'm trying, I try to kind of approach the first version of things I do so that anybody can do it. And then we go kind of go crazy with that uh, from there. So just to give you an example of some of the things that we're going to do now and some of the things I'll go over eventually. These are some examples of some tables that I made. These are actually currently up in my store, but this is a miniature sort of small, like writing desk, office desk that I made that we're going to work with this this wood that I used on top of this this is poplar it's a it's a cheap light hardwood um and it's very easy pretty easy to work with so we're going to work with that and the base is made of um quarter inch uh steel bar with uh steel uh rods in between to create that sort of uh I think it's called a um a hairpin desk uh sort of that type of a vibe uh with a modern twist and so you can take this desk and you can put Melbot. This is Melbot. Say hi, Melbot. Hello, everyone. And this is an office chair that you can buy. These are uh, available. They're they're made, mass manufactured in Asia. You can get these for like 15 bucks, 20 bucks online. I bought mine in Vegas at a show, but they are readily available online. So I modeled these desks to fit Melbot with this chair. So you can see she fits nicely at this desk, and I'll, I'll get you a better shot of that in a sec. But we're gonna make, we're not gonna do the steel legs this time, but I will get there eventually. I'm just gonna go with the basics first so anybody can start doing this and fiddling around. Some of you will be able to figure this stuff out right away too. So if it uh, seems kind of obvious, just hang in there for me. We'll go over as much as possible uh, this stream and probably another stream because it's going to probably take a couple streams to make all this. The table we can do in one stream, the chairs we may have to start and finish in the next stream. Um, here's another example of a table I did. This one, uh, this is like a, a weathered vintage looking sort of kitchen dining table or like pottery table that I did. Sorry, the light's not directly under the light here. Yeah, it's about the same. Um, so this is basswood, um, which is a very, very common miniature working wood. You guys, it's next to usually the um, balsa wood. <laughs> it's next to balsa wood in hobby stores. It's the stiffer light wood, um, and this is just basswood. It's all made of the same size piece too, which is this three quarter inch wide piece. There's four boards. On the bottom, there's two boards. The center, that's one board that I sanded and shaped. And then these are three boards that I glued out and then I routed out uh, like a little divot. So it's all one piece of linear material. It's all this piece. So I used, well, it's, it's not one piece, but one length, right? So this is like three of these boards cut and glued together with wood glue. 
and then uh, paint it with a couple layers of spray paint and sand it down. That's how simple you can, that's how simple it is to make something like really effective like this. And you could obviously do whatever color or style you want, shape it how you want. So stuff like this, kind of what we're going to get into. A um, little bit more detail than that though. And um, this, let me flip the camera for this one. So this one is a miniature resin river table. So I've made a bunch of these. I sold a bunch of them in Vegas last month, and there's some that are going to be for sale at the International Miniature Show, the Tom Bishop Show in Chicago uh, next month. I have three pieces that will be for sale there. One of the other vendors who's a friend of mine, Mod Pod Minis, Sid Reduschel. There's an interview with her on my channel. She volunteered to take some for me um, and try them out at the show. Uh, probably my three favorite pieces. Uh, well, three of my favorites. My Some of my favorites already sold, but... This one is a Live Edge Resin River Table made with walnut um, and a couple of different uh, colors of resin with little miniature flowers embedded in it with steel legs. So I make stuff like this. I've got bigger ones, I've got tinier, I've got larger ones, smaller ones, dining room tables, office desks with all different configurations. So I'm really getting into this making miniature furniture. It's something I've actually always wanted to do a lot of, but and I, I finally have reached a point where I'm like, okay, I need to make some of this. So. I've had these ideas in my head for a long time, and this is something like this Live Edge Risen River Table. I will probably make a really nice produced video for all of you to reveal that full process, but the basics we're going to go over now so you can get started experimenting just like I did, um, and then I'll go over uh, the progressive layers of um, difficulty as we go. So that is what's in store here for you for this stream. Hello. Her alternate face is like... A android skeleton face and it's really creepy but she looks less threatening with this <laughs> still looks a little threatening kind of like you don't know what i'm gonna do next because i'm an android i will cut you i don't know she gives me that vibe with her little creepy android face if you want one of these by the way these are made by toa heavy industries you can get these on big bad toy store and a few other sites they're a little pricey but they're very detailed and they're very articulate they made a they're called the synthetic human female and they've made a synthetic human male, which I think is sold out. Uh, so if you want him, you probably have to get him like in buy sell trade groups on Facebook or on like eBay. But I think you can still get her. Um, and uh, there's all the I, I just I love models like this uh, for modeling stuff that I make. I have a crash test dummy as well from Damn Toys. So anyways, it's been a couple weeks since the stream. Thank you guys for being patient. I did a members only stream with a wrap up of everything I did in Las Vegas um, for them. And uh, you guys are going to reap the benefits of that when I get to finishing editing um, two videos from that. One is an interview that's got a showcase of really cool art and stuff you'll like and something else. So if you're watching in the future times, thank you for watching and uh, leave a comment below because I'm going to ask this to the live audience right now because I'd like to know if you could have anything, anything that... Anything that you want in miniature, no holds barred, no cost in the way, no nothing. Just something you would love to see as a tiny object and hold and have, what would it be? I'd be very curious because I know everyone's probably going to have a completely different answer. And I like to see what people say because it can reveal a lot about their interests or what they like. I have a billion answers. You know, I don't really have one. I have a lot of things. But what would you like to see in miniature that you've either maybe never seen before or you personally would love to have like completely hyper real because that's what i'm going to talk about in a couple of future videos one uh with the interview and one with um uh, something that i'm working on so i'd like to know what you guys think because i think it would be an interesting topic to explore in depth with all of you as a community in future videos so and oh yeah there's something else i was going to show you I, uh, I got some of this recently. I don't know if you guys follow John Reeves. Um, he runs the Boneyard in Alaska, and he has uh, he's he his his ranch or not his ranch. I say ranch. His uh, plot of land that's a gold a gold claim in Alaska has gotten over the news uh, like all over the news in the last like three years because he has um, basically like. 10,000 woolly mammoth skeletons on his land. They just keep finding them frozen in the tundra, like not fossilized. Some of them are fossilized, 
but some of them aren't. They like got frozen and now they're unfreezing as he's mining for gold. It's it's a whole wild thing. Go go down that rabbit hole when you have time. But I bought some mammoth from him. I bought some mammoth ivory. And don't worry, it's extinct. So it's, <laughs> I'm not taking ivory from elephants. I'm taking my mammary. Uh, mammary? That is the wrong word. Mammoth ivory. That was the wrong word. Mammoth ivory. Uh, and I want to incorporate this into some of my art. And I haven't figured out yet what. But he sent me six pieces of mammoth ivory. Let me flip this camera around again. Look up my nose for a sec. There we go. So this, these are all pieces of mammoth ivory. So, and they're from different part, different strata within the woolly mammoth um, tusk. And I thought it'd be really cool to break these up and incorporate them into miniatures, incorporate them into some of my, like I, I make some jewelry sometimes, it's been a long time, but I like to do some of that eventually, get back around to it. And so I just, uh, I wanted to, I didn't want to miss an opportunity to get a little bit of this before it probably ended up costing too much later so it's already quite expensive so this this like this looks kind of like petrified wood or wood chips but it's actually broken off pieces you can see the layers and the strata there of mammoth ivory these are probably the two most dramatic pieces they look almost the exterior strata um looks almost like petrified wood but when you turn it you can see that it's got a different type of grain and it's actually, you know, there's layers to it. There's the exterior layer that's got the most sediment in it and the mineralization. And then there's like the internal layers, almost like, you know, peeling away like a leek or an onion or something. So, and there's like even little fibrous furs and burrs and whatever. So like this one almost looks like, yeah, see there's the fiber there. Like that's, you could probably get some woolly mammoth DNA off of that because some of this isn't fully fossilized. So it's very, very cool. Very cool. We could do some Jurassic Park experiments in the shop. So anyways, I thought that would be cool to show you guys. I got some of that. You can go, you can follow the Boneyard uh, Alaska on Instagram. And it's linked to, I think he said his daughter runs the Instagram. But I was talking directly with him when I bought these. He was the one messaging me. Um, so it might just be him and his family that run it. But I think it's called uh, Ice Age Fossil Works. They put up like they don't ever sell whole fossils. They keep all of those. Their 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 plan is to basically keep all of those for however long, and then document them eventually, because they have so many they can't keep up with it. Um, and uh, they sell like chunks, broken pieces and chunks, as though they'll sell to the public. And uh, they can get pricey. Like a chunk of it that's like this big could sell for like four grand, depending on like you know the quality of the piece. And that's kind of how they how his family like keeps funding like their side their side stuff while their gold claim makes their main income and he's i think it's him and he's got three daughters and a son i think i don't remember all the details but it's just it's fascinating i love history and prehistory so I, I went down that rabbit hole and listened to all the podcasts and read all the interviews and all that stuff and it's very very cool so oh yeah hello everybody hello 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 to the channel members I see everybody in here. Night Wolf, Michael Dumas, Eric Bradshaw. Uh, who else is here? Tammy, Shane, Little Treasures. What's up, Nancy? Sharon, a Zamboni. Maurice, what's up? Tammy. Yeah, okay. I see. Thank you guys for all the likes too. By the way, twenty-eight people watching already. I know it was a little bit of a last minute. I didn't last minute uh, pop up of the stream. I just kind of was. I hadn't decided on which thing I wanted to do today. That's why I hadn't put it up on Friday. So anyways, here we are. <laughs> you don't know that. I don't have to explain that. So what we're going to work with today is basic materials uh, to make some cool stuff. And the reason I like that, I already said, but this is all stuff you can get likely at like even Walmart. Some of the stuff you can just get off the shelf at Walmart um, or even the Dollar Tree. Um, this is, these are craft sticks you can buy in a bundle. These are round ones that come in various sizes. So this brand, I bought a bunch of these when they were on sale one time. I think it's, it's this purple logo. And uh, I'll buy, whenever stuff is like super on sale, I'll just grab like a, like 10 of these because they're like a buck or something or two bucks. And there's pre-cut little pieces of lumber basically for you. Um, even though they're technically popsicle sticks, but it's good hard wood, good small hard wood to use as base material. And if there's like bent pieces and stuff, it doesn't really matter because it's so cheap. It's like, yeah, you can throw those out or use those for scraps or broken piece of a diorama whatever you're doing um 
I also use these little dowels sometimes for things, for little details. Um, and believe it or not, I actually use tongue depressors and popsicle sticks a lot for things. They are surprisingly strong um, and you can do quite a bit with them. So these are popsicle sticks and tongue depressors that I've cut the rounded tips off of to use as like base veneer for, not for fine, fine, fine art, right? I use a hardwood for that, but for basic stuff um, to just make miniatures and props, this is it is excellent, it's an excellent material. You can cut it with scissors. Um, you don't have to have a saw. Obviously you can cut it with saw too, but uh, it, it works fine with just scissors. It's, it's a wonderful material. Um, this is uh, miniature scaled plywood, and plywood is just layered sheets of wood, if you don't know. I can show you here. So you've got a top layer, a middle, and a bottom layer. So the middle layer is probably um, like pine or some sort of softwood, like, see if I can stick my fingernail into it. Yeah, probably like pine. And then this is probably like sheet birch, and it's, it's glued in together and laminated, glue lamb, they call it, um, into a big sheet. It's usually in a big white sheet, and this is a strip cut off of it. This is literally what they make like higher quality cabinets and furniture out of, or like medium to high quality cabinets and furniture. This is the base material for a lot of it. Um, it's just the thicker stuff. This is just the miniature stuff, but it's very strong. It's got a flex to it. You can stain it because it has a veneer and you can cut it very easily. It's a little bit more expensive than like the popsicle sticks and tongue depressors, but it's still, um, it's a good affordable material. So you can get this stuff at most hobby stores. You can even get this, I think you can get a quarter inch thick at Home Depot and the hardware stores. And some hardware stores have this. This is an eighth of an inch thick, which is more to scale for like one twelfth scale miniatures, um, if that's what you're going for, or like one eighteenth scale. But, you know, there's that. And let's see. So this is just some... Uh, pine remnants that I had, just some rough pine, but it's pre-cut to about 3 sixteenths to an eighth of an inch. And it's got a really wide grain, meaning like there's a lot of space in between the grain lines. So it's a cheaper wood. Pine is usually a very cheap wood because uh, it grows quickly and it's soft and easy to cut. It's, you know, it, and they grow a lot of it for, for lumber for houses. You get a lot of Douglas fir, pine stuff integrated into things for homes and so uh, it's a cheap wood and it's easy to cut easy to glue as well um, you can sometimes get really pretty grain patterns on the tongue depressors and popsicle sticks too like right here this is either a birch or a poplar tongue depressor a really really wide one and just look how pretty that is very very pretty so you can take stuff like this and stick them up next to each other and do wall paneling. You can take them and make tabletops. You can make cabinet veneers. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. You, anything you can do with life-size, you know, full-size wood and life-size object, you can do in miniature as well. And if you find little grain patterns you like, you can use this stuff. You know, it's like, it's, it's cheap, but it's effective. So who cares? <laughs> if it looks good and it's strong and does what you need, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, man. Um, another example of a sort of attractive looking grain pattern, like some wave in there. If you stain that, if you stain that, you know, a pretty color, it would look nice, you know? So I may just use this. <clears throat> and this is just a bunch of pre-cut doll house lumber that I got, but this is the same stuff. This is just basswood pre-cut, pre-cut links. You can get this stuff at the hobby store. You can order it online. I'll leave some links below too for some of this stuff. Uh, if you don't have this stuff near you, just some more pine. This is uh, like cheap. I think this is pine. Yeah, pine veneer. It's a darker tone. Might even be like a cheap cedar. I don't know. But another thing that I like is these square rods. I really like using the square rod and square dowel rod. You can, This is a pine one that I got at Home Depot. Um, I get this stuff for just basic linear stuff. I use this. In my uh, last episode of Art in Real Time where we made the shoji screens, I use this. And I also use this, which is the basswood. And this, you can see, it's got a very fine grain in there, which looks nice in miniature. It looks scale appropriate. So this is always fun to use. This is a poplar dowel. You can get this stuff at the, the hardware store. Um, it's it's really, it's quite strong. And it's less likely to warp like pine wood. So if you can go towards hardwoods, um, the better, the harder the wood, the harder it is to work with, just so you know. So like mahogany, oak, um, walnut, that's going to be more difficult to work with and you might sleep, your knife might slip and cut yourself if you're not used to it, especially with hand tools. So be careful. 
But stuff like this, like poplar and Douglas fir, this has a nice grain to it. It's simple, it's pretty, it's basic, um, and it's cheap, and it's much easier to cut. Um, and, but it's still considered, you know, like a light hardwood, kind of like basswood. And so this stuff is great for making miniatures with as well. This is pine. I usually I usually buy the quarter inch stock. Um, I don't always go with the eighth of an inch stock, eighth of an inch stock because I usually end up sanding things down, so it ends up getting thinner. The bigger you start, uh, the more you might have to measure and mill it down, but it just depends on what you're going for and the look you're going for. I want to kind of make a basic table with you guys, but with uh, like a little table skirt and some cross um, supports at a 45 degree angle and some simple legs just to kind of go through that process. And then we can talk about different ways you could personalize the process along the way to make it more special or interesting for you. And then I'm sure that will spark some ideas for you. Um, and again, speaking, keeping in the theme with minimizing power tools, this is a large miter box. This is a regular sized miter box. You've seen me use my mini miter box many times, mini miter box many times on this channel. This is a miter saw. It's got this um, overlapping um, piece of retaining piece of metal on the top that overlaps and grips the saw blade. It's really, really fat and wide. And it's got teeth perfect for cutting wood and a nice wooden handle that's easy to grip. And then it has this. It has this little lip here, and that is so that you can abut it onto the edge of a table, like this on the cutting mat, or on a table, so that when you put your saw into the box and you saw back and forth, the saw doesn't slide it back onto the table, right? It'll prevent it, right? Obviously it's bouncing up a little because I have no weight in it. But if you got it like this, It'll keep it from sliding up. And then you can do 45 degree angle cuts in both directions with this without having to compensate. And then you've got a 45 degree angle at this angle over here. So these are great to have around if you're gonna cut larger pieces of wood and you don't have access to power tools like chop saws and table saws, miter saws, band saws. You know, having one of these around, the big one and the mini one is very handy. So you can put this piece of wood. This is the pre-cut milled length or milled width that you get this in. Um, let me show you actually <clears throat> over on the other side of my shop <clears throat> or other part of my shop. I have a whole thing of these, so I'll buy them again when they're on a good price. I'll buy a few of them that I like. So here's one that's a lighter color, darker color, lighter, darker, different tonalities. These are all, um, poplar. Um, so I like, I just, I'll buy them when they're cheap and just keep a stack of them. Got some other things in here. Here's some more of that plywood, um, miniature plywood. This is just a, a bamboo scrap round table. A friend of mine actually gave this to me, but this is some, the kind of thing I'd pull out of the dumpster if I saw it. See that's bamboo pressed in there. So you could, this is the type of thing you need a power tool to break down, but I'll save stuff like this. Look for stuff like this around in the garbage or nearby. You might be able to turn it into a miniature. Um, and I have a whole stash of little pieces of miniature wood down here. This is a, what, three quarter by three quarter inch pine. This you could use for legs or table bases, which we might, we might actually use this. Some more plywood. This is double, double stacked plywood with multiple layers. Um, this is just some other material. Uh, I guess that's it for a miniature lumber that I've got lying around. I have some, uh, well... I have this box, but you guys have seen this box before. All kinds of pre-cut stuff in here. There we go. Poplar. Hobby board. So I was making a buck to drill some stuff in. So hold a thing in this corner and drill some drill some holes in the right place. Here, here's some more square dowel rod. Let me grab a few more pieces of this actually. And I have this and stuff we used last time. Okay, now here you go. Here is a birch veneer, very, very thin. This is like maybe 330 seconds. And this is bendable too, you see that? Especially if you soak this in hot water or you, if you have the means to steam this uh, or put it in a pot of boiling water, you can bend it around a curve shape and you could like rubber band it on or, or clamp it on, let it dry and you could do rounded veneers on things. Some ideas for you there. Um, wooden pre-cut pieces. I don't even remember where I got these. These were all pre-cut like this. I'll save bags and stuff like that. Wooden beads. These are easily found on Amazon. Uh, you can use as like table uh, miniature decorations or 
table leg, table feet, excuse me, can't think of the word there. Table leg feet. And some more of these. I need some sticks. Okay, there we go. Sticks. There we go. So let me show you again. I like to show from scratch, from the beginning, how to do things as often as I can. And what I'm going to do is show you how to figure out the math. All right. <clears throat> so I already know the math, but I'm going to show you the math because if you don't know it, you can, you can make a table that's too big or too small really easily. So let's go here. Office Depot. We're not sponsored by them. Okay. So this is sort of like I said, a basic dining table. This is a little under width um, because I just used the four pieces of wood that I started with to get my width, which is fine. There is no, it doesn't have to be this or that, but obviously there's certain size standards for a what you would expect as a basic, you know, dining table, which is what I'm going to start with is like a dining table with chairs, or we could do a dining table with two chairs and a bench, something like that, just so you can see a few variations. So we're going to start with the table, which is the, the most... Um, probably the most important part because that's going to inform the height of our chairs to some extent. So let me remember, I think I did this. Let me see what this was at. This was two and five eighths by what? Two and five eighths by six probably. Yeah. So most tables are going to be around. So if this is your tabletop in real life. IRL. Um, the stereotomy in my brain wants to make this proper, proper legs. Okay. Um, and an edge. There we go. Okay. <laughs> hey, what's up, Fat Red? Um, so you're going to be about 70 inches plus or minus. When you see plus or minus, that means give or take or a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, depending on what you need. By like 30... Um, 30 if it's a small table like well it could be as small as like 28 inches but as big as like 38 to 40 inches for a big table so if you're working in like 112 scale uh, if you want to simplify all this because 70 inches right and 28 inches that can that can be a calculation right i've gone over how to scale you just take this and divide it by 12 and then you're, you're going to get like 5.7 something when you if you do that and 28 divided by 12, you're going to get like, what is that, 2.375 or something like that. But if you want to make it simpler on yourself, if we just call this 72 inches, and we call this 36 inches, which is right in between and right over, because we do a plus or minus, a little more, a little bit smaller, this is going to be 6 inches, and this is going to be 3 inches. So if we're somewhere right around 6 inches long, because we're going to sand things too, right? You're going to cut all this and sand it. It's going to end up a little smaller after you sand it. So if, we're, if we start out around six inches and we start out around three inches, we know our tabletop is going to be basically right in the pocket for a standard dining room table or large desk um, or like, oh, like average size desk, I guess, like a good medium desk um, and or you can, a low large coffee table if you wanted to do shorter legs to make a coffee table, right? But this is a good starting point. Right. And then from there, you kind of change styles. When you get really skinny, you've changed your style to something other than a dining room table. When you get really long, you're getting to like a dining hall table or a conference table. Right. That's how that'll inform stuff like that. So, um, Tammy, I'm just reading your comment. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Use whatever you can. Really, this is about measurements. This stream is about measurements and fittings, right? How to get stuff glued to, to each other and cut stuff so that it looks right. So you can use bamboo, you can use cardboard to make a table if you want. If you really want, you just have to think in flatter materials, but you can use cardboard and you paint it, you can make a very convincing table. It doesn't have to be wood. So you can use plastic, plastic's fine too. Let me take a sip of my gross coffee, hold on. Oh, that's disgusting. Give me the crab juice, okay. Comment below if you got that reference. Okay. So we're going to go with a table after I drew a million things that is six inches by three inches. And then our height. This is the tricky part. So, hello again. 
Um, I have this chair that you that I can use. If you have a chair that you want to make a table for, now is your time to get it out. Put your table at the bottom, or your, your feet at the bottom, not your table. And then you want to know your... Uh, it's good to know, to your, know your, your butt height, your seat height, and then know the armrest height. That's very, very important. So you need to know the armrest height and the booty height. And if I just get my ruler out... In one twelve scale, our booty height is it is one and five eighths inches. So if you're making like a, a, a bench, you don't have to worry about the arms. You can just make it at one. You can make sure the top of your bench is at one and five eighths, right? So if you're gonna do a just a simple bench, you know, with a, sorry, I can do this a simple bench with like some little standy legs, then you know your your actual floor to top of bench should match. One and five eighths. Your arm height, though, you want that to go under le table. This is where you have to start thinking like a designer and an ergonomic designer. You don't want it to go like this, right? You ever been at a desk where you try to roll forward and it goes eh, 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 like that? So you got to think about that in miniature. If you want it to be accurate, you want it to go. Oh, that's very comfortable. Then you can get in there and you get stuck, and the chair rolls forward and you, ah, crap, and then you break your leg. You know, so you could do that if you want to, but don't do that. Um, woo, ADD and hard right now. Um, so that is what we're going for is the table, uh, can swing over the chair. The chair can swing under the table. So this measurement, um, is two and three eighths, probably a little less than two and three eighths. So we want, this is where we want the bottom of our table to not be any shorter than this. So this would be our table top up here. It would be hitting the bottom of that. And for this, we don't want it to be any higher than that. So this would be hitting the seat height. We would, this measurement would actually go up to the top of this, if this is the seat. You understand that? That's important to keep in mind too, because if you add things together and you overlap or underlap or go over or under the measurement, then things are like, ooh, they're butting right into one another. And you don't want that. Let me show you how to get this measurement with your figure or doll or toy or whatever you're making this for without, if you don't have a chair like this as a reference. So I'm gonna take, Melbot 3000 here and hello um so we're going to pose her into a sitting position so this is it's crude but it works we're just making a pattern basically so we're gonna put Melbot 3000 in her sitting position and just make sure if you're looking straight down at your action figure or Melbot beep Look, she's floating. Okay, sorry. That looks funny on camera. Um, so here is your floor. Here is the butt height. And if you want to, uh, usually tables, you want the top of the table to be where, where you think ergonomically your elbow would be comfortable. So a lot of times your elbow here is going to be, your elbow line where the, the bend is, is going to be right at the table height, right below it, or right over it, depending again on the style. So you could have the butt height for the chair be right here, but then when you're considering the table height, you can let the elbow height, which is, if I'm looking straight down, it's going to be right there. So when I bend her elbow, her arm will naturally sit easily onto the table. This would actually be a little high because it's at the top of the pivot. If I go at the bottom of the pivot, it would be like right here. So I know my chair. So now I can sketch the chair because I know my butt height. So there is the chair. And then I can also get a back height if I want to have a proper back. Most chairs, especially like dining room chairs, they stop right uh, at the right below or in the middle of the shoulder blade, roughly. Um, but some of them, like if you're doing an office chair, you have an extension that goes up here to the top of the head. That's how you get your measurement there. So basically sketching her onto a two-dimensional chair. And she's going to live in three dimensions while the sketch lives in two dimensions. Because we like to create parallel dimensions when we sketch our miniatures. Um, and then, so now you know your basic heights of your chair. So we can kind of sketch a basic chair because we're going to make probably a basic chair. We can do a couple fancy things with it, but we go like this. And now we know the, and this is where knowing your material thickness can be important. And this is going to be unique to you and what you use, right? So don't go directly off what I'm doing unless 
you are gonna use the same materials. This is quarter inch thick poplar. So if I use quarter inch thick poplar, right? And I make sure I've got a quarter of an inch width here. This from here to here is the, the height that I'm gonna cut my leg at. And I generally cut a hair over so I can sand it down. So this height is gonna be little, it's actually a little over one and a half, but I can just round it down to one and a half. So this is one and a half for my leg height. And then I know my thickness. So if I naturally just plop my thickness of wood on top of these legs, I'll get to the correct height, which is gonna be one and three quarters, right? Cause one and a half plus a quarter is one and three quarters. So we'll just mark this one and three quarters. And then now I know the depth I need because that's also very important. If you were to make the chair too shallow, her legs would be really far off it. She might fall off or not sit straight. If it's too deep, her legs are gonna come forward. So this would be the full a full depth chair. So she sits in this perfect formation. So for a full depth chair, I need to cut my top slab for the seat, my actual seat piece. It looks like one and three quarters. So one and trying to write sideways, one and three quarters for the seat width. And then the actual top, normally for the back of a chair, you'd actually carry your leg all the way through. You would notch out the seat or you could abut it to the back depending on what you want. But I'm just trying to get a total height here. So total height for the seat back, that worked out real nice. That's three and a half inches to the top of the seat back. So, or top of the, yeah, top of the seat back. That's the right word. <laughs> I was like, did I say that right? I guess it. So now we know our leg height, so we can cut four legs or we can cut two legs. And then we know the back height, so we can cut two of these if we want to do that type of chair, or we can cut a solid piece. Like this can all be solid pieces, right? So this could be, if we want to keep it ultra simple and ultra modern, we could cut a flat piece of this for here, a flat piece for here, and a flat piece for here, and glue it all together. And there you go. It's a very nice, simple, modern chair. Sand all your edges, make them like a little rounded, then it will look real nice, and maybe something you find at Ikea, you know. Um, or you can get real fancy and cut individual pieces, which is what we're going to do. We'll do at least one chair like in this style, like a basic traditional sort of kitchen table chair. And then maybe we'll do something a little bit more interesting. But that is how we get our basic um, seat heights, table widths, table lengths, and such. So also, again, like I mentioned the bench before, this one and uh, three quarters for the height of our seat, that would also be our matching bench height. So again... For example, that didn't work. That wasn't dramatic. Okay, so let's just say, this is kind of what I'd like to do with you guys, is a table, if I can draw isometrically correct today, I probably can't. Simple table, maybe we'll add some type of detail with our cuts and sanding with Quattro Lego, that is how they say four legs in Sweden. And then a bench. And we'll probably just do very simple legs like this. Just something simple. And then we'll probably put a brace under here. So I'm gonna do a dotted line to indicate it continues under here. Right, this is what it would look like on a drafting plan. You guys can see that. There we go. And ooh, lovely ink. Um, and we'll probably do a brace under here to stabilize the legs, kind of like I did under here, this little piece. And do do do. There we go. And then under here, we're going to have a whole skirt set um, with some braces to make this actually accurate and strong. And then over here, we'll do a couple of chairs. So we'll do maybe like what I said, that notched out chair. I don't know, I'm just sketching this as I, as I go here. I'm not really sure what the design will look like. We'll figure that out as we go. Um, but that doesn't look right. Mess that up. Okay, maybe an X back. <laughs> you get the idea. Here, I'm just cause I'm trying to draw it behind another object. I'm failing. You're failing, Seymour. What is it with you and failing? Comment below if you got that reference. Something like uh, this is more like what I'm thinking. Do, 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 do. I can't draw today.
today at all. Okay. Um, and we'll probably do, I'll, I'll sand in a little seat. We can do a little butt groove. We can sand that. I'll show you how to do that. That's very easy, especially if you're using soft wood. Um, so we'll do like maybe one of these and then, I don't know, something special for the other chair. I'll probably make that up on the day we do it or when we do it. In this stream or the next. Ink. Oh, this thing is bleeding all over the place. Oh, well. Shai Hulud blood. Comment below if you got that reference. I'm full of references today. Okay. Let's cut a tabletop. Enough talk. can sit over here on our desk and watch us work okay and what did i say poplar poplar so this is important too pick a, a pretty grain that you like don't just cut something if you're going to stain it or even if you're not it's worth thinking about these things so i have these pre-cut pieces but forget making it easy some overspray from spray paint right there so we can pick a pretty part of the wood if we want something it's got two tones or like an interesting wave in it. Obviously this grain is very large. So that's something to consider too. If you're trying to make a scaled down table, you're typically not gonna have a grain pattern that's like a foot and a half wide because that's what that scale would be. If you put her at this table, she's standing next to like a table made of a giant sequoia, which can happen, but obviously we don't wanna kill giant sequoias in our miniature world because they're beautiful trees and they need to stay up forever and never be touched. They're amazing if you've never seen them in real life. Um, <laughs> so, excuse me, size of grain also matters if you wanna go for realism. If you're gonna paint over it, ignore everything I'm about to say. If you're gonna stain it, sand it, or leave it fresh and just clear coat it like this, just like fresh, fresh, nice, uh, uh, natural wood, um, look at the grain pattern. So the grain is really wide and thick here, but you move down here and you've got uh, a much tighter grain pattern. It looks a little bit more scale appropriate. Like if I if I kind of delete this section over here, that looks a little bit more like a table wood in 112 scale. If I go over here, I'm gonna have a totally different uh, selection as well. So I don't, down here, this looks kind of out of scale. And over here, this looks kind of out of scale. So if I were to cut out this section, that would look nice, right? So this, I believe this is pre-cut to three and a half wide. Let me just double check. Three and a half, yeah. So I'm gonna cut a half an inch off this side to get us to our six by three. So I can, I can take into account what I'm looking for. Were these pre-cut to three inches? They are. And are these six? They're six and a half. So this is actually pretty close to the table size we're going to use. So I could use this to kind of help me see. You could also make yourself a little window box, which I just realized I probably should have done. You know what? Let's do that. I've been meaning to do that. Let's do that really quick. This is about showing you guys how to do things. I'm not talking about showing you guys how to do things. See if we can get a dramatic paper pull on this one. Yeah! Oops. Okay. Plug my phone back in so it doesn't die. All right. So, pencil, pencil, pencil. Where's the pencil? Pencil. Okay. We're just going to draw our three by six inch piece on here and make ourselves a little template. Three inches. Six inches and three inches and six inches dramatic pull all right I don't know what that phone number is oh I know what it is make ourselves a magical wood grain selection viewing porthole. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just to guide our eyeballs. Voila! Your window to wake in. Okay, so now... This is gonna be our table. So if I move this around the piece, I can pick a spot I like. And I actually kind of like that one, just the way it is. I could do like a two-tone thing where I have the center line split, a little bit of a transition. Put the other side really quick. 
And then, yeah, this side, I'm gonna get some of that larger grain pattern in there. I don't really want that. I'm gonna go with this side. I'm gonna go with all the way over to this side. So I'm gonna cut off this side. Yep. Okay, okay. What's up from New York? What's going on? New York City. I bet that's not annoying to hear all the time. Okay. Whew. I'm just going to do a little pencil mark here with this and then I'll get a more refined measurement in a moment. Okay. There's that. And I'm just going to pencil you in for later, little buddy. Pencil measurements. There, oops, yeah, that's straight. <laughs> and we'll do another one here, which is about a half an inch in. Using my cutting mat to line things up from my top down view and then Mark, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Mark, what to cut off. This is going to be my table. And this, if I cut this off cleanly enough, we might be able to use that as some type of under support piece. So, miter box to the rescue. Just lining this up on the center line and cutting. Bonus, you don't have to go to the gym if you do this all day. Or the geim, as they say in Sweden. Alrighty. So there's a rough cut edge, but that's okay. We're gonna sand that all down later. And there is our main tabletop. I'm gonna actually show you an alternate way to cut the wood too. So this wood has got a little bit of a bow in it, but I can fix that as we glue and clamp it together. I noticed that as I was cutting it, do, 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 do. Do, do, do. Let me get my, uh, I'm going to get a different charger cable for my phone really quick because for some reason the voltage is not coming through and I can tell my phone is going to die in about 30 minutes if I don't change it. So hold on everybody. I'll BRB. By the way, I hope everybody's doing well. I didn't mention that at the beginning of my stream, but I hope everybody is doing well. Shut up and make art and do well. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna do this hopefully in an interesting view of the camera. I'm just gonna use a metal ruler and an extendable box cutter. Um, the smaller you go, the more likely you are to break a tip in the hardwood. Um, I'm gonna do multiple cuts, so I'm okay, but if you need to go with a bigger blade, just be careful. It might be easier for you, depending on how you feel about whatever you're doing. So, here we go. So, just to show you, 
See, we're getting a pretty deep cut, which is that. So this is a soft enough hardwood. Uh, I mean, it's a light hardwood, but you can cut through it with a box cutter pretty easily too, if you don't like the motion of the large miter box. Again, that's miter box spelled M-I-T-R-E, not miter, M-I-T-E-R, M-I-T-R-E. So corners, when you miter them together for a picture frame or for a baseboard around the bottom of a wall, that's M-I-T-R-E. M-I-T-R-E-B-O-X, that's it. <laughs> miter box. That didn't work out. I thought there were more syllables in the word. I think I've used that joke before. Okay, so I've got some tear out. That's what I get for being in a rush. Got a little tear out there. That's okay, we can sand that down flat or we can use that as a detail. We can like round off the edge if we want. So that happens. I probably would do that a little bit too fast. That's why. More cuts, a little bit shallower, repeatedly will save you from that. But you can also see how I'm pushing on the back of the blade and using the, the heel of the blade I can also whittle this down to get the shape that I want because I can use the side of the blade to scrape as well. Get wood chips. So, yep, and flatten it out like that. So, that is our basic tabletop width. Ow, little tiny baby splinter just poked me. Um, that's our basic tabletop width. So, we're going to work on the skirt. It's gonna go underneath. And since I cut that over, I'm just gonna let that tell me that I need to do a detail here. So I'm gonna do this. I'm just going to do this and do a little detail. I don't know what this style is called. Oilers Workshop Bevel. So I'm gonna do it rough like this. You can leave it rough like this if you wanna go for like a log cabin look, but I'm gonna sand that over and round it. And that'll be the bottom rounding up on our table. Same thing over here. If you're gonna cut towards yourself, never put your thumb like this, right? Have my thumb up here, and this has plenty of room. It's not gonna, I'm not gonna hurt myself. Be careful. You can also just do this with all sandpaper. I'm just doing this because I'm comfortable with it. But you, you could just put a whole sheet of sandpaper down, hold this at an angle. In fact, I'll do that. I'll show you on the ends, because it'll be easier on the ends, because this is an ingrain. It's gonna be harder to cut like that. Um, but you can put a piece of sandpaper down and just do it like that which is what I will do in a second. Uh, this side. I'm comfortable with this, I've done this a lot. Don't have your thumb up here, by the way. Surefire way to stab yourself. Go to the emergency room for some stitches. Don't do that. So I could do this on the ingrain here, I'll just show you. But you hear the noise? It's cutting through more fibers at the end, kind of like when you cut a steak with the grain, um, this is me cutting with the grain, and then you cut a steak against the grain, that's what's happening, it's the same concept. And when you cut with the grain, it cuts really nice, but it chews hard because you have long strands of meat protein. When you cut the meat across the grain, it cuts all those little grains up into tiny bits and it's easier to chew. So ironically, with wood, it's the other way around when it comes to cutting and shaping. Let me get some sandpaper. This is 120 grit sandpaper, 120 grit, and we're just going to do this. And there we go. We're getting our little sanded bevel. You could round this over all the way want, all the way if you want to get a bull nose that's fully rounded, or you can do this angled bevel. I think I might stick with the angled bevel. I don't know. Something you'll notice about sandpaper too, when you lay it down like this, the edges curl up a little bit. And when you go to sand like this, you might see a little bit of a curve in your sanding. So you might have to put pressure with your finger on different parts of the wood 
as you sand or even pressure and hold the sandpaper down to get a straighter line, which that's getting there. It's still a little rounded. Sometimes I'll like put half of it and then put the other half of it. Like do half and half, yeah. See, and then it evens out a little bit. Still a little off, but I'll come back with a hand sander in my palm and do that. Same thing here. So you go like this or like this, whatever you want. For all of those of you who are watching in the future times who know more than me about woodworking, I apologize. <laughs> Feel free to correct me in the comments below so people can read and get a better edumacation. I'm just sharing what I've learned over the many years of fiddling with stuff. I do not consider myself a professional woodworker. I know just enough to do the things that I do. And then if I need to learn more, I go learn more myself. So I'm sure that's what you're all doing here right now with me. looking good it's looking like i meant to do it so this is happy accidents full bob we're going full bob ross on this keep hearing my keys jingle sounds like a cat walking up to me or something or a really, really, really tiny Terminator. Not bad, not bad. Obviously, if you have access to things like a belt sander or a table belt sander, this will take you a few seconds. But again, this is, I have one of those. I could just run over there and do it, but that would not be fun and it would be very dishonest about the art in real time aspect of what we're doing here. It'd be like those baking videos where they're like, here's one I prepared earlier, which I do do that sometimes. Almost. All right, I need to get some of this dust off of here. Onto the floor you go. To be forgotten about and start a fire later. Okay. Okay, I think that's a good enough for a start. I'll refine this later. Yep. I just want to keep going with the rest of the shape of it, and then I will always do all my refinement sanding, or most of it, before I do the glue up. So we'll save that for later. But that gets us our cool shape. So now we've got a style going. I've added in a style here where you could do this, you could do this top down, right? Or you could do this bottom up like that. Excuse me. And I will do a little rounding over at the top edge. Very, very subtle. There's a reason for that that I'll explain. I kind of naturally figured that out on my own, what I'm what I'm gonna what I'm just saying now. Um, but I watched a woodworking video uh, not that long ago where a master woodworker explained why that's a good idea. So I'll go over that with you guys when I do that. Because I was very reassuring to go, oh, that's why I did that. <laughs> Sometimes I do things and I'm like, I don't know why I did that, but I feel like it makes sense. And then later you're like, oh. I guess that's why I did that. It just felt right, you know? And then you find out it was right, or at least advised. Not right. But... Now we're going to do the skirt. It's not really a skirt. A skirt is what, like the table skirt, where they have like leaves that come down or a larger skirt. We're just doing a very small skirt. It's more of a... I don't know. There's a, probably a technical woodworking term. I don't know for it, but it's the thing that goes around the bottom of the table. It's very short. 
I'm just going to pencil it in too so I have a guideline for myself. By the way, you can erase pencil off wood. Well, I have my eraser. Wow. That's why you want to use pencil on the actual wood itself because you can just oops, erase it off. So I'm gonna go. You, this is where I'm gonna. We're gonna have the uh, the skirt. It's gonna be in in from the edge a little bit stylistically to make it look clean. You could go all the way out to the edge if you want to, but traditionally it's inset right, so you can reach under the edge of the table. Like if you were reaching under the table and grabbing it, and you don't bump your fingers on like this hard edge. Like if this is the bottom of the table and you reach under, you don't hit your fingers. You know stuff like that. It's also stronger. It's a it becomes a corner brace for the legs why we're putting it on so this is roughly the material I'm gonna use instead of using my ruler I'm just gonna use a piece of wood and I'm gonna line this up on my cutting mat and just sketch in the extents or outer edges of where I want this to be which is a quarter of an inch inset from the outside edge I'm gonna do that all the way around like that and I'm gonna try to do it faint I don't want to draw it in really really strong because I want to be able to erase it later or cover it up easily Everybody, I see you coming in here. Thank you for being here. Again, if you're new here, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more of this. If you're watching in the future times, what's it like? Tell us, please. Inquiring minds would like to know what it's like in the future. Do we have flying cars yet? Or if we have them, are they affordable? That's the real question. Economy. Okay, so I just drew a little reference guide for myself so I can see what I'm cutting and where it is going. And now I need to pick a material that I have enough of to go all the way around this dimension. So I need, what is that? Well, it's six, six, three, three, a little bit less than that. So we're looking at three times, three and three is six times three, 18 inches. I need 18 inches of material that is the same dimension to get our effect. <clears throat> Parallel dimensions. I don't think I have 18 inches of this, and I think this is a different size. So I might have to use an alternative material. These are the same, but these are not gonna be, I don't think these are nine inches long. Oh, maybe, oh, maybe, maybe, it might work. I might be able to make that work. Okay, now it's time for the mini miter box. How adorable. M-I-T-R-E-B-O-X, that's it, it's a box. All right, so I am going to mark on this one using my marks I drew on my table bottom where I need to cut the skirt off. There's an ultra simple way to do this and then there's the slightly fancier way, which we're gonna do, because it's only like a couple extra steps. I'm just gonna mark this right there. And I'm gonna mark, because I'm gonna 45 this, because I wanna actually do a quarter mi corner miter. I'm gonna 45 this as well, because we're gonna do uh, mitered corners all the way around. So when we look from the outside, we have two nice joined pieces of wood rather than a butt and pass. Um, which you can do. This is a butt and pass. So this is the pass. It's going to go past, and this is the abut. Boom. So on an end, if we did a butt and pass, or a butt, excuse me, butt and pass, the corner would look like this. But I want to do a miter, so the corner will, these two pieces will intersect like this, but at a 45 degree angle to each other. 90 degree angle, excuse me. The 245 cuts, 90 degree angle. And where's the one I just marked? There it is. So we're going to 45 degree angle cut this like this. So this is the benefit of having these 45 degree angle presets. We can get in here and I can just figure out where my mark was and do it. Okay. 
And just for the sake of ease, I'm gonna do this because this is awkward to hold this in this position. There we go. There we go. So you see that cut this off at a 45. So if we were to take these and just flip these, we would get a nice 45 degree miter cut. Obviously we need to deburr that. There's little pieces of wood sticking out. The burrs. And then I'm gonna cut this 45 really quick. So yeah, I put this on a piece of wood here because it's so small, just to kind of hold it together. So I'm not shaking my whole table. There we go. Let's check it on the piece and make sure it fits within our extents of our dimensions correctly. It does. See, that's where we're going to be doing the 45 degree, 90 degree corner. Sorry, I keep saying 45. Over here and over here. So I can use this to cut in a mirror image piece out of this larger piece. So I can simply take this and put it in the box. What's in the box? And I'm lining up my outer edge here so that it's in the right place. And then I'm lining the angular cut I did on this piece up, you see that? With my miter box slot. And then I'm going to use that as a guideline for my first cut on this piece of wood so that I can remove, actually, kind of did that wrong, but that's okay. It should actually be like this. My apologies. If I cut that, it would actually be one width wider. Sorry, I did that wrong. If I carry this cut over, this one is actually going to be longer than this one. What I should be doing is putting it on top. My apologies. Put it on top of the other piece. This it will be a correct cut this time. So I'm, again, lining up this other end over here. And I'm holding it and then sliding this into place to match the saw slot. Then I'm doing my cut. Live TV. Actually, on this one, I'm going to do that. Come on. Sometimes you get a piece of wood that's bowed and it's bowed up or down or back. And what you're doing is you're fighting the push of that bow. So this one I can tell is it's actually bowing upward. It's uh, bowing up like this. So as I push down on the wood and move my saw, it's wanting the cut opening is wanting to clamp down. Whoops. It's wanting to clamp down on the saw. So as it's like bowing up and cutting and I push down, it's going grip, 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 re-gripping onto the saw. So sometimes you have to figure out that and like let your finger off of the wood a little bit so it will cut. So I'm just gonna push down like out on the outer edge out here and just put pressure this way so that it will encourage it to cut without putting pressure on the blade and stopping my blade. See, there we go. There we go. So <clears throat> this, it's very subtle, but it's got a little bit of a curve in it like, like this. Just very subtle, but it was enough to when I was cutting, it was going squeeze, 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 and squeezing the blade. So just something to be aware of. If you're mad at your saw, or you're mad at your miter box, you might, sh you might shouldn't be, that's correct English. You might shouldn't be mad at the box. You might should be mad at the piece of wood. Something to be aware of. And then I have to cut the 45 off the other side. Almost forgot. Sound like I'm from a Mark Twain novel. You might shouldn't be cutting the wood like that. Back in my day, we cut our wood with our teeth. Okay. So these should, they're a little, one's a little bit longer, but I can sand that down. So those are two sides there. So if you put these next to each other, you can see 
The one I just cut is a little bit longer. So that's where you get your sanding block. You can get sand foam sanding blocks as well. I like using this because I can switch the paper out. Foam sanding blocks are nice for getting into curves, but you can just hold this at the same angle that you cut and just knock it down. And a lot of times when you do this, you'll end up rounding it a little bit. So I'll go like this and then I'll turn it and do it to get rid of that roundness. I will check, it should be a little bit closer. Yeah, there we go. It's only like 1 64th of an inch longer now, which is acceptable for this scale. We don't need to have it any small, any bigger or smaller. That's fine, like that. So these go right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tape these on with some masking tape. You could pin them on, you could glue them on right now if you wanted to. I'm gonna do a glue, a final glue up on it um, later. But I'm just going to get this down where it needs to go. And then tape it in place temporarily. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Like dot. Same thing over here. There's other ways of doing this. This is just a quick way, a quick cheap way, right? You can clamp things, like I said, you can glue things. You can use double-sided tape to hold things in place. I actually do that a lot. Like I always, I'm always trying to find ways to hold things temporarily in place so I can check fittings. Um, with the XPS foam, I, I discovered the sewing needle pin method. And since then I've seen a lot of people using that now. Um, and uh, I, with the wood, I'll tape it together with masking tape, which I know is a common woodworking technique. I'll tape it together with masking tape or use double-sided tape to hold bigger pieces together temporarily to sand, sand match and fit pieces that need to kind of join together, you know, and I don't want them glued yet. I'll do stuff like that. So, so those are our two, see that? That'll be underneath the table edge. So this is our table top. Ooh, ah, and then that's our table skirt. Skirt. Okay, so theoretically, I should be able to just, yep. So I'm gonna flip it, it'll be this way, but obviously I can't fit that in there to draw an accurate line. I could just take a measurement. I could hold it like this. I could abut this piece here, and I could abut this like that, and I could make a mark there. I could flip it like this, which is what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna make a mark over here, and I'm gonna hold it like this. Just gonna do it this way. Make a little mark where that goes. And what this mark is for is this mark is to cut the 45. Just make sure you demarcate your cut correctly, right? You don't go this way with it, because then it's not gonna fit. You need it to go this way. So this is the point that I'm worried about right here, this little corner right there. We're gonna cut that off at a 45. A little tip for starting your saw blade too, whether it's a mini miter saw like this or a gargantuan miter saw like I was using before, instead of trying to keep it perfectly straight at the beginning, if you let your saw rock up or rock down a little bit, it'll cut a starting groove into the wood. And then you stay with that groove for a few, few more strokes back and forth, like one, two, three, four, five, and then flatten it out, start flattening it out. And then that cut will, the groove will happen and keep your saw straight. But if you try to go straight at the beginning, what can happen is your saw can bounce around on the wood a little bit. And then you get all these cuts on top and you're like, wow, that looks like garbage. And then you want to start again. And then you scream and throw it across the room. I've done it many times. Let me uh, show you without the miter box what I mean. So, <clears throat> um, see what I mean here? So if you just are going like this, what can happen is you can go like, oop, I didn't do the right, oop, I didn't do the right, oop, I didn't do the right, and then you get all these cuts that look like that. And now your wood is all messed up, and you know, maybe you can sand it down, maybe you can't, but if you go like this, if I hold it at an angle for my first cuts like this, and then I let it go flat, it becomes really easy to do. So if I start it at an angle like this, see that angle that I created? 
if I can show it a little bit better. So it's it's deeper and then it gets shallower this way. If I now I can just plop the saw back in there and keep going at that angle, and then let the saw go flat as I cut. And I can get a nice straight cut without bouncing it around. And then I can ruin it if I want, just like that. I'm the best ruiner. Okay. So let's check our feet. This is, the, there we go. Pretty close, pretty close. It's not flawless. It's a little bit wider than it needs to be, but it's pretty close. See, it's a little, little over there. That's okay. I'm just because I'm just going pencil and eye. I could be very perfect and measure it if I wanted to, which works well with with woodworking. But this time, if you just uh, in this case, excuse me, if you just fit things as you go, they'll be nice and strong and sturdy. Again, going back with that back and forth sanding method to see if I can get this. There we go. There we go. Now, see, just a little bit of sanding, and we are golden. Golden. The corner is a little bit splayed apart, a little bit, like it's doing a little bit of this. But when we glue it, um, and then we do some like little fine sanding, that'll probably kind of solve itself if it's that tiny of a little uh, difference. So you see that little, there's a little, well, actually, when I push, when I put pressure on it, it's nice. But it was kind of sitting like this. If it's like this at an angle too, um, just keep going. Just the glue will probably fill that in. If it's a big gap like that, that's concerning. You might want to cut a new piece or sand it or just sand it till you get that angle fit right. You may have to take it off and on a bunch of times. Keep track of which side you're holding down to. If it's a mirror image from side to side, I've made that mistake where I'll hold it down this way and I'll go, oh, I need to sand that and I'll sand it and I'll put it down and I'll come back and pick it up and go, oh, it's wrong still and sand it some more and they'll realize I was sanding the wrong side for like 10 minutes and I have to start all over. So I know this pre this wrong cut I started a few minutes ago actually goes on the left side facing the bottom of the table. So that's how I'm keeping track of it right now. But just taking the pencil and going like left, right, you know this is the top, that's the left or the right, so you don't accidentally do that. And sand the wrong side and again, yell at it, throw it across the room. Save you all that trouble. Okay, so I'll go ahead and tape this in place. So it's got a nice tight fitment. Let me make sure it looks good before I squish the tape into place. Yes, okay. Hello, all 50 of you wonderful people. Thanks for stopping by. And thanks for all the likes, guys. As always, I appreciate that. Let's people know I actually went live today. Okay, making progress. And we have one more to make. So this is something you can check. And this one I kind of did in a rush, but for those corner fitments to make sure they look nice. Like sometimes when you're cutting through your miter box, even though it's nicely angled and set with these preset slots for you, there is play. See that? There's wiggle in there. Meaning you can drop your blade. <laughs> meaning you can accidentally cut at a very slight angle. So it might not be perfectly perpendicular. It might be like 91 degrees or 89 degrees. And that is what causes those corners to be slightly open to one side or slightly far apart. Or maybe your blade like curved a little bit when it cut through the wood. So you actually get a slightly curved cut. So it opens up or is too tight at the tip of that corner. These are just things you have to, they're just gonna happen in woodworking. So just accept them as normal. Don't get mad like, I didn't cut it right. Don't do that. You know, you, you cut it right. You just need to refine the cut after you cut it. So that's okay. Um, speaking from experience, if you can't tell. <laughs> so I'm just going to check the fit here on this. I'm going to see how tight that looks when if I just, obviously I can't hold it perfectly perpendicular here. But if I hold it there, does that corner look nice? If I lay it flat on this piece and it doesn't, see how it's opening up a little bit at the bottom? That's okay. That's not a very big deal. I'm not going to worry too much about that. But... Hold on one sec. Oops, that's the wrong button. There we go. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to worry too much about that. It's very subtle. 
but if it was bigger, I would try to pre-sand this piece to fit, and then I would cut the other side, or I would do both. I would cut it and then fit it. So I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna flip this over, and I'm gonna mark where I want that. You can also, even if, if, if you want to too, another trick to make sure your cut is even tighter, take your cutting tool and use that to make the mark. Just like that. So now when you put the tool on, your tool doesn't go a little bit to the side, a little bit to the right. The tool ends up right where you want your cut, right? So I'm just gonna sketch though, that just so I don't lose track of where I am. My angle needs to go this way, not this way, this way. So now I know where I did that little notch out. Like there. Now I know it's absolutely in the right place and I can't undercut it. I can overcut it, but I can't undercut it. I mean, I can, but it's gonna be easier not to. And that notch out was for the right side. So I'm gonna make sure this is orientated to the right. Okay. So now I can see some little See, now that's this corner is actually doing exactly what I'm describing. <clears throat> it's tight on the inside. Like this is all just double checking. This is all still tightly fit down here. Up here, this corner looks pretty good, but see, it's actually opening up towards the top there. And this one is opening up towards the bottom there. So I could sand the bottom of this side and the top of this side. So let me just do a little bit of that. So I'm going to sand the top of this side. I'm, so I'm holding this. So it's at a slight angle, like I'm showing you extreme angle, but it's a very slight angle. Just sanding that down. And then I'm gonna do the same thing over here. And we'll see if that did anything. And it did, it's a little tighter. So that is a lot tighter now over here. Just a little bit of sanding. And that's quite a bit tighter over here. It's not perfect. Maybe I will take a little bit more off. Let me go ahead and just do this. Just a little bit. Let's see what that looks like. Yep, that's much tighter. So this, I would be fine with gluing it up like this and sanding it and staining it. I would think this would be, at least in this scale, from like this far away, that's gonna look perfectly fine. If you wanna fiddle with it and be a perfectionist, I would encourage you to do that. The more perfect you make things, especially the first time you do it, the more you'll learn. I would encourage you to, obviously I'm demonstrating this to you guys right now, so I'm just trying to get through it, but I would encourage you to take the time to make it as perfect as you can because you'll pick up little things and you'll get better at each skill if you do that, at least the first time around. If you try to rush through it every time, you're gonna find that over time, your work may not be as refined as you want it to be down the road. But if you take the time up front, the first couple of times you do something to just take the time to do it as good as you can at the moment, and then kind of carry that attitude forward, your work will get better and better and faster. It'll get better faster as well. But if you just kind of rush through it because you're like, I wanna get it done, you might find you don't learn a lot and you're just frustrated by the end of it. I've discovered that in my own artistic journey and creative journey, making journey. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that too. Just slow down, do it how you want. Take the time. And don't blow your table apart. Okay, so I'm going to just label these. One, two, three, four, so I don't lose track of what goes where, in case I want to disassemble this. No disassemble. All right, so there is our basic table and skirt. It has a mini skirt. Its father would not let it go out looking like this. His father, this table's father is ashamed of it. And I guess that's me. Okay, so now we can choose legs. We can do whatever we want with legs here. Um, time to get fancy. Um, <laughs> so we can do all kinds of stuff. And, you know, make a basic one for the first one, just so you have the skill, but then in your back pocket, but then get fancy. I'm going to do something, maybe something not entirely boring, but these are already like nice dimensions here. So if this was scaled up to full size in real life, this is a little bit less than a half an inch. 
So this would be like five inches. These would be big honking table legs. So see that there, oops, big honking honk. So there's your five inches by five inches. That'd be a pretty sturdy table, like very beefy. A lot of wooden leg tables will start with like four by four or five by five, and they'll sand down and in to create those round shapes, uh, like on a lathe or, you know, they'll be uh, uh, worked down with a tool, whether mechanical or by hand. So you can do that here if you want. I probably won't do that on this stream just because it's kind of, it's a little tedious, but you could cut your table length, uh, table height legs, table leg heights, whatever. And then you could do something like this where, remember how I showed you how to carve with the box cutter? Actually, I'll do a little demo here. I'm not gonna do all four legs, but I'm just gonna use this one because it's, uh, it's, well, no, I shouldn't do that. I should actually use the one I'm talking about. <laughs> I can't make up my mind. Um, so this, this, let's say we cut this leg off right here and this was the top. The, the skirt would need to extend down below this to right here. And then we want some dimension of it below it. So let's just say like a half an inch. So we're gonna leave this blocked out as square, but then we can demarcate, we can draw it on with a pencil, like a cut line. And actually, if this goes smoothly, maybe I will do it. I don't know. And then you can take your box cutter. And this is where you need to be careful. Do not put your thumb right there, put it below it. Or you can do it on the table. Or you can get a sander, Dremel, same thing. And you can start to whittle off the wood. Careful, careful. And you can get yourself a very rough shape. I'll do another one here. Be careful, you will cut yourself if you don't do this correctly. Um, if you're scared, don't do it. Go get yourself a Dremel. You can even do it with sandpaper on a sanding block. It'll take you a little bit longer. If you have access to a sanding drum or a belt sander, this will be very fast, right? Again, but I'm showing you the way with no power tools. The olden days way. Okay. Then you can take a sanding block and follow that same face you just created. Same thing here. And there is one side of your table leg, right? And so your table face, table top, tail, ugh, table top would be here, the skirt would be here. You'd have this nice structure and then it would taper down. You can do that as dramatic or as, as small as you want. If you're really fancy, you can cut like notches into it. off of there and there you go there's like a simple tapered table leg with a little detail obviously i did that in a rush take your time you can make it really 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 nice if you want i mean this side look a little nice this side look a little rush but if you make all the sides look like this face you can make a really really nice looking table leg Ta -da. okay so i'm gonna do a smaller one though it's more basic i'll probably just round over the corner the sanded edges just to go for sort of a contemporary look and what was my measurement on my table height? Does anyone remember? Hello, is there anybody out there? Okay, my table height, my leg height, remember, remember? Le chair goes under le table, two and three eighths was my leg height. Two and three eighths, I'm just gonna use my cutting mat here to mark it. So, so here's the cool thing about using a miter box again. You go two and three eighths, which is right there. I cut this and then I can use that as my measuring stick, literally. Literally. So, go here, do my angle. So I'm at an angle I'm pointing down. Now I'm going flat. Two 
Ta da! Now I can just use this, right? Set it on top of there. Press my finger up against that. And just slide it in and line it up. Shoot, bop, ba dee, da doo, boo, ba doo. As mom always used to say. Shake everything. I actually bent this a little bit. That's okay. It bends right back. And just a little tip too. If you're going to do what I'm doing right now and you're going to use your first cut to measure your next cut, keep using the first cut. Don't use the second cut. So I cut this one off just now. This was the first one. I'm going to cut this one off and I'm going to set it aside. I'm going to use my same first piece and mark the next one because what can happen is if you cut the next piece and then use the next piece as a guide for the third piece and use the third piece as a guide for the fourth piece, Everything can be off worse and worse and worse because you're, you could be accidentally adding a saw blade width or a saw blade less to your cut so they could get progressively smaller by little bits or progressively bigger. Just so you know, they will be all a little bit off. We will have to sand them, but this will save you extra work by just using the same first piece to do your cuts with. Let's see if I can get a more interesting angle. Do, 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 do. Tables. These are all at a slight angle and my blade must be getting a little bit worn out. So, uno mas, por favor. Sorry, Spanish folks listening for my terrible Spanish. And by the way, if you are not a 112 scale collector, maker and you need to do this in one six scale like if you have play scale dolls or hot toys just take all the measurements i've given you and double them if you just double them you get yourself into the one six realm so instead of a six inch long table you get yourself a 12 inch long table instead of a three inch wide table you give yourself a six inch wide table then you're getting into the realm of like a small six scale dining table you probably have to make it a little bit bigger than that the scale is weird especially when you scale up when you scale down it's pretty easy Scaling up, I don't know why, it's something about the math. Sometimes you have to go a little bit bigger. But if you scale up, um, just double all my measurements um, or double double what I did or divide by six instead of by 12 and you could build play scale stuff and use your doll as a reference or your hot toy as a reference for chairs, seats, whatever. Whatever. All right, so here's my legs. You can see they're off, you see that? It's not a perfectly flat cut. And if I butt them all, look how different they are. See that? They're still going to be all off a little bit, but we'll correct that here with some sanding. We'll solve that. So what I'll do is I'll take all these and I'll let them all fall down and I'll get the smallest one, which was probably my first one. See how big of a difference I get? That's, as, that's the big of a difference as I get from one to one, cutting them that way. So there's ways you can avoid that. Again, this is just the basic straightforward one. So so actually I might cut this one again. That's a pretty big difference. That's like an eighth of an inch. Let me do that really quick. Let me cut it again. Right here. <clears throat> right here, right now. Look at that. Look at that troublesome piece of junk. Okay. Thanks for coming by. Okay, now we're a little bit closer. So what I'm going to do is flatten one side. I'm just going to hold them all together as tightly as I can. I'm sanding in different directions to keep it even. See, it's already knocking it down quite a bit.
pretty much flat. There's a little bit of a roundness to this piece here. Let me keep going a little. Pretty close, it's a little wonky. I'll probably have to sand this multiple times at multiple points in the stream, just so you know. There we go. So those are all a little bit closer together now. They're still a little off. And then down here, I've got a lot of sanding to do. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do two at a time, just to simplify it for my hands. You could also tape these together if you wanted to. I'm just holding them. See, if you use 120 grit sandpaper and you're using a light wood or a soft wood like basswood, um, it goes pretty quick. If you're using like oak, uh, you probably should just go get a power sander. Uh, so it's not, you're not doing this forever and giving yourself arthritis. Or do it like that. <laughs> okay, so those are close enough for me to do gluing up. These, I'm going to size these down. These are a little bit tall here. these but what these are now they're even enough to where I can glue them to the bottom of the table and then what we do is we let them dry and we actually flip it over and sand the whole table down at the same time and then all the legs can be even and we there's no wobble in them so again you could spend the time to cut these a little bit slower get them more accurate do less sanding that's a good practice I'm just trying to get this done for you all so you can see it here so now what we can do is we can, these basically are gonna be my table legs like this. And I'll probably just pick the flattest side of these, which looks like it's that one. Actually, I might refine these as I glue them in. Yep, there we go. Oop, nope. That, there we go, okay. So that is our basic uh, table height. And I can tell this table probably should have been a little bit wider because of my leg widths. The chair's not gonna fit in there. You see that right there? The chair's not gonna fit in there. So I should have probably gone three and a half inches. I probably should have left it that width or done the skirt farther out and the table legs smaller. These are all different styles, but again, this is a demonstration piece here. So we're just trying to get the table made. Um, or I could leave this as a, just a side table and I could do like a cross beam detail or like a little rail detail. Actually, I'll do that. We'll make it a certain style. We'll go with the flow and make it a style. So I'll do some detail across the side here for where you could hang something or put a rack or like a cage or wire or whatever. And then, um, uh, we'll leave this open so it can be open seating just from the sides, like maybe a small apartment table that wouldn't sit six people or eight people around it. It'll just sit four and nothing on the ends to help save space. We'll do that style of table. That's what we'll do. So the next step is going to be to glue this down. You could, this next, the next few steps you could do in a different order if you want to, but for the sake of the stream, I'm gonna do them in this order. We're gonna glue these down into each other in the corners. And then I'm gonna um, probably put another piece on this and clamp it and let it get to a point where it's dried enough. And then I'll glue these to that and I will set that aside and then we'll maybe start the chair or a chair or the bench or something. <clears throat> so yeah, where's my glue? There it is, there's my glue. Rubber bands, glue. Clamps. I'm gonna probably leave the tape on until I put the glue down.
Again, you can do this whole process without making a skirt too. Again, it depends on the style of table you need. If it's like a workshop table in a miniature barn or a pottery barn or whatever, um, you don't have to do as fancy of a thing as I'm doing. You can keep it really basic. Just follow the same measuring principles, you know, or ideas. I don't know if you really call them principles. I guess they're just kind of like, here's an idea. So there's a billion ways you could do this. Generally, if you can, it's better to put glue on both sides of the wood. If you can put glue on both sides of the wood, um, you'll get a stronger bond. Um, in miniature, though, it's not as big of a deal because you're not dealing with large weights and li like leverage that might pull at the lignin and the actual wood fibers more than you want them to. So in miniature, you can get away with applying it to one side. It's not going to be a big deal. But if you really want it to be like fine miniature woodworking, get yourself a brush and apply it to both sides. Um, which I'm going to do, I'm just going to probably glue it to, or do one side here and just spread the glue onto it like this. And then I'm just going to use my finger to spread it because I can take the excess glue from my finger, put it on the corner joint, the miter, mitre. How many weird ways can I pronounce that word? And then we're going to replace it where it belongs in its little home. And then I'm going to hold it really tight. See the glue squeezing out of the side there. I'm going to hold it really tight. I'm going to slide the glue off like that. Um, actually, where's my cutoffs? I'm going to use my little cutoff 45 here. and I'm just going to do this to pick up that glue. I'm just going to wipe it off on my table. You can use a napkin, paper towel. Because that glue is difficult to get off that corner when it dries. And if you try to scrape it out, it might pull some of the wood with it. Because wood glue is stronger than the lignin inside the glue that bonds it. That's why it works really well with wood. Who would have thought? Okay. That's sufficient for this. If this was like a large piece, I would actually getting, be getting my clamps on all of this and clamping these down. But I'm not worried about that for this. Okay, I'm gonna do the other side. I'm gonna, it's good to, instead of going all the way around in a circle, because you could have it go like parallelogram on you, go side to side. It's a little bit easier to control the squareness of it if you do that. <clears throat> you don't have to, though. I've just noticed with my own tendencies, it's easier. If I go side to side and mirror image everything I do, it dries more even and strong. It's not necessarily a rule. Just a recommendation. And I'm gonna use a piece of wood just to make sure these are lined up straight with the wood behind it. I'm using this to make sure that these are, uh, this line right here is correct. They're not off like that. That looks really good. I'm gonna push hard. This one doesn't have as much glue. And I'm going to put the tape down, put the tape down like that. Okay. And this is uh this is three. This goes here, yes. And same thing here. It's like golfing. It's a tense moment here where he approaches the green to make the putt of a lifetime. Commentary is very quiet at this moment. Focus. Laser focused. Focus. Okay.
Just for the fun of it, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna mess with your minds. I'm gonna put the glue right there. Ha ha! I mess with your mind. Beep, 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 beep. Sometimes when you glue things up too, you'll notice something maybe shifted. That's okay. Like this is shifted a little bit. There's a little open right there. I can fix that later though. Something shifted when I did all this. That's okay. Tension ended up in a different spot than it was before. Okay, so I can fill this in with wood glue after this dries and some sawdust and close that up. So I'm not gonna worry about that right now. And I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna go, bam! I'm gonna make a table sandwich. And I'm gonna clamp this. Little baby DeWalt clamps, you can buy these at Home Depot. I'll put a link low, below too if somebody wants to get them from my link. Um, these are wonderful little clamps. I love them. I think I have nine of them. So, um, I'm just going to set this aside to start to glue up. I can go over here, little glue up land. Do, 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 do. Okay. And these are the legs. Don't want to lose those. We'll go back to that. When the skirt glue dries. It sounds like some weird phrase. I'll be darned if that's true. Even if the skirt glue dries. Or something like that. Okay. Bench. B -b 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 bench. B -b -b Benchy and the jets. So, bench depth. Butt depth, seat depth. Benches are different than chairs because chairs you want like a full depth so you can sink your tailbone into it, your knees have something comfortable bend over, and your lumbar sits on something. A bench doesn't need to be as deep as a chair. It can be, but it typically doesn't need to be. I discovered a miniature uh, like about a one inch width. It works really pretty fine for a bench. Um, for like an average standard sitting dining table bench, you can go a little bit bigger if you want. I wouldn't really go smaller. Maybe seven eighths of an inch you can get away with. But... Um, one inch, one and an eighth, one and a quarter, probably be a little bit big, but it could work. This is probably about one and a quarter deep for the chair. Let me check. And it's one and three eighths deep. So actually, no, it's one and a half deep. So that's really deep. But we don't need that for the robot's butt. So let me just get a piece that's about an inch just to show you what I mean. It'll make sense when you kind of see it. All right, these tongue depressors are, I think, close to an inch. They are a little under an inch. So if you're sitting at a, at a bench next to a dining room table, see that? That looks pretty natural, and that's just under an inch. So if she were to back up, which she wouldn't do on a bench, she'd fall down, but most people aren't going to do that. And if she has room to lean forward and still sit comfortably, like a park bench. So I'd go a little bit bigger than this. This is, looking at my cutting mat here, this is about 7 eighths. I'm going to go like maybe an inch or an inch and a sixteenth. It's about the right depth for a dining table bench and six inches long. So I need to cut a piece of wood. The leg should be able to cover the miter angle gap. Uh, they could, depending on how you cut the legs. If you put the legs over the miter gap, or you put the legs inside the miter gap, or you mortise them into the gap, uh, it depends on the style of table you're making. So that would be up to you uh, if you want to do that. So we'll go. We'll we could, we'll make that decision when I get to that point. I could um, cut it out and have them overlap and hide a little bit of that gap. Uh, I think that's what you're implying. Or I I was going to set them inside my skirt. Um, to give a tiered effect once I flip it over it'll look tiered and like more detailed um, but you can do whatever you want uh, there is literally tens of thousands of styles of table that are all good and correct so whatever you want to do you should do that uh, bench. bench 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 do I have a pre-cut one inch piece I don't think I do I'm gonna have to cut one blast Probably stick with the same wood too, huh? 
Uh, that's plywood. Hoping I had a pre-cut piece of poplar, but I don't. I don't think I do. Hold on. Let me go. Let me wander into the wander into the magical realm of extra parts over here. Hold on a sec. and lots of other stuff. Okay, I guess I'm gonna have to cut a piece. Oh no! Ta-da! Yep, that is an obtainium fault. <laughs> it's one of many. <laughs> Okay, I thought I had some pieces that were already cut down. I probably do, I just don't know where they are right now. Six inches. This one, for the benches, because it's such a thin piece, I'm not as worried about grain depth. Like, this is really wide grain, so this doesn't scale very well for tabletops. But to cut other pieces out of it works great, which is why I purchased it and added it to my collection. Uh... Get my speed square out, and we're gonna measure six inches over, which is right there. That was off. There we go. We're gonna cut right there. By the way, members, I should have some uh, have a live stream with you guys this week, by the way. If you're watching the future times, you can check that out in the member section. If you're a member, stay tuned. I'm going to be filming an intro for one of my upcoming videos, and I think I'm going to do it on my DSLR camera so I can set up my phone camera to watch, and you can do a little watch-along, talk-along as I film that intro so you can see what I have in mind, and you can tell me how stupid I am. If you want to. So what I might do is I might start this cut on my miter box and finish it with a blade. Because I actually think it will be a little bit faster. Because I think my blade is kind of dull here. Um, I have a hacksaw that will work just as good. But I don't know where it is right now. You could use a hacksaw blade in this miter box. <laughs> my groove literally but um and i'm just gonna finish it off with a blade because i want to Extendable box cutters are great. Put some tape on that so nobody cuts themselves after I throw this in the trash. Now I have a nice sharp blade. Maybe not. This poplar is really strong. It's strong. Okay, I made a mistake. That's okay. 
art in real time. Ow. So tempted to take this back to my chop saw. It's a long cut after all. I did that one a little slower than the last one, so it's actually a little straighter. Okay, let me put this over here. And erase this. Need to see that. Go ahead and knock this down. Deburr it. See all those burrs? Just go like that a few times and they're gone. Bye bye, burrs. In some parts of the country, they are referred to as splinters. Okay, bench. Bench, 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 bench. Bench, 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 bench. Now I'm gonna use the blade because I'm gonna cut with the grain. Should be a little bit easier. So I'm gonna go with one and an eighth. That's my one and an eighth measurement right there. I know this is not an exciting angle for you, but that's what I gotta do. Might get my bigger blade out for this. Here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to carry this around. This never works very well, but I'm going to do it anyways. Shut up, Mom. Don't tell me what to do. Okay, here we go. Here we go. There we go. <sighs> Actually worked just fine, and I just needed to deburr it. to cut my next piece. Again, if you have a table saw or a mini table saw, which you can buy from Micromark, you can just go and you're done. But I felt like torturing myself on stream for you. It's more entertaining. Yeah, that actually is working pretty good. It's a soft enough wood where it will work. Soft enough hardwood. 
Sometimes when you use a really soft wood like pine and try to do this where you cut both sides, it like goes way wonky. That's why I kind of was like, maybe I shouldn't do this. But this is right in the pocket of hardness to where it will, I guess it'll work out. Haha! -ha. Look at those little edges. You can plop those down together and deburr them. Look at that! Hello! Okay. Here is my here's two benches. I guess we're making two benches. I don't know why, but we are. Here's two benches. And so what I can do now is I can make the legs for the benches. So I'm gonna cut the legs, which I drew earlier somewhere. Those legs, those little legs. And I don't want them to be the same width as the bench because in my opinion, that will look kind of tacky unless we do something fancy with the joinery and we use like fancy stains. I'm gonna shrink it in, make it look sort of like a standard table leg concept, as they might say. So I'm going to take this and position this so that it's a little bit overlapping by like a quarter of an inch here. And then I'm going to trim this last piece so that that is the width that I end up with. See that width right there is a little bit smaller than that. So when I glue it to the bottom, it will inset in the same manner that the skirt is inset under the table. Just basic stylistic choices to make it look like, you know, somebody meant to do it, you know? Not like literally, not like they have the stuff they have at the dollar store that's just like stapled together. Like stuff like this where it's just like, bam, bam, slap. Like I'm trying to make it look a little better than that. So, <laughs> but that works for like junk furniture. If you need like background junk furniture or a miniature antique store or like an old miniature basement scene or something or like a miniature yard sale, you can get that dollar store stuff and dip it in some stain and scratch it up and put it in the background. It'll work great. Probably use this as well. And this will be my brace piece for under the bench. Under the bench downtown is where I took a nap. Cut these, they will fit nicely on the bottom. So, what was my height? My bench height. So, my bench height, right? This was the, the seat height, it was one and five eighths at the top, but this is a quarter of an inch thick. So, if I take a quarter inch off one and five eighths, that gives me one and three eighths. So, I need to cut bench legs that are one and three eighths, so four bench legs. I'm cutting the right one, this one. <laughs> okay. I'm going to just mark this on my table really quick here at one and three eighths.
there. And get the mini miter box. And I'm going to slow down on these cuts. I was really fast when I did the legs. It probably was a little bit haphazard. As I was being like, hey, be careful how you do this. And then they were all way off. Oh, well. Making in a rush. Making on TV. That's the way it goes when you're me. All right. Just going to slow down here. That's kind of annoying. Come on. Instead of holding it over it, maybe that was my mistake. Maybe I wobbled too much. I'm going to go ahead and use it to mark it, then cut it. I'm put the big side of the wood on this side. One of my mistakes with that last cut, why I was shaking so much, is I was holding the smaller side. I was holding this side instead of this side. Tried to slow down, and I still made a little oops. There we go. There's two Legos. So let me show you here what I'm doing. This be my tabletop, my bench top. So these will be the legs that'll go under here. I'll probably space them about, I'm gonna mark the center point. So I'm gonna go of, of where I wanna put the legs. So I'm gonna go one inch in, and one inch in on each side here. And that's gonna go, whoops, that's gonna go there. I have to send that a little flatter. And that's gonna go there. And then this other extra piece that I cut off from my piece I made smaller, I'm gonna make this my brace. And if I was making two of them, I would try to cut two pieces that are the same size, of course. But I'm just gonna use where I laid these out to mark where I need to cut this. Or I could use my tool to mark it. And now I know where to cut it here. bunch of poplar dust in my face. Good thing it's not toxic. Like walnut. That was fun to discover. Good old toxic walnut dust. Are we in? We're a little over two hours into the stream. So if I had power tools and I was using all my power sanding equipment, I'd probably be 30 minutes into this. So just to get an idea, if you choose to do this, you've never done it, and you have access to power tools, that's how much time it can save you. If I wasn't explaining and demonstrating and whatever, I'd probably be 30 minutes into this at this point. You know, maybe even less, maybe like 25 minutes. So you can bust out simple, simple tables pretty quickly. If you have access to power, and even if you don't, it's still quick, but it's just really quick if you have access to power tools. So I'm going to put the slightly less perfect sides facing down. Just got to look at these 
to determine which sides those are, which it looks like. Let me just sand these a little bit better. Get these a little flatter. This will go in between. All right, so now we have an opportunity to make this slightly more refined than basic, right? We go in with basic shapes, basic rectangles here to fit this little bench together, right? It's gonna look like that, right? We can take what we have here and just fancy it up just a little bit if we want to. And it, that, for the stuff that's under the, tape, the, the bench top, uh, the seat, it's good to do this now before you glue it. So it's just something we can do. Instead of leaving this edge perfectly sharp, let's just take, actually, let me take my 300 grit sandpaper, or 220, sorry. And I'm just gonna round over these edges a little. See that? So I just, instead of this sharp edge here, I just did a rounded over edge, and that is just enough for your eye to go, ooh, somebody took the time to make that look nice. And it can, it immediately looks better, and it feels better in the hand if you pick it up. So I'm just going to go around all these edges and do that. Not the bottom and top, but these outward facing side edges. Excuse me, I think I just burped a little. <sighs> And now I have nothing to catch edge or splinter on. At the beginning of the stream, I mentioned that this is kind of what I was naturally doing, but uh, uh, watching a master woodworker explain that this is a good practice, even with real full-size furniture, to just round over that edge, even if you can't even tell it was. Because what can happen is over time, you can have tools, you know, or, or things or pieces of fabric or clothing rub up against those edges. And if you have a little bitty micro splinter just sticking out, just a little bit, just poking its little head out, and a fabric, piece of fabric like this runs by it, it can catch that splinter and tear out a chunk of wood. Or if you have a tool come at it and it's a sharp edge, a heavy tool hits it, bing, and dings it, it can create a chip and then splinter out. If you have it rounded, it's more likely to depress in softly and be less noticeable or deflect because the natural roundness of the edge will deflect a tool or something coming up against it and it will preserve the edge. So this is actually a edge preservation technique used in woodworking where they just round over the edge just a little bit to help with deflection and not have any snags or catches over time as the wood ages and dries out. It will preserve that edge and keep its nice look. So this is worth doing a miniature too. You see how quick I did that? It just will make it look more refined and it will actually make prevent those things or or deter those things, I should say, from happening to your miniature woodworking project. So I was already doing that, and then and just to hear that, I'm like, oh, some of those things I thought of, some of those things I didn't think of. But it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? One of those things you don't necessarily think about, but if you look at all your tables in your house, they probably already they probably have a slightly rounded or beveled edge, right? And just just doing that, it just they feel nice. Ooh, they feel like dominoes. I love it. <laughs> so the same thing here. Um, I'm going to actually refine this a little bit. That edge is not exactly perfect. So I'm just going to sand this down a little bit more. Oops. <sighs> Almost there. So another opportunity to here with this um, brace piece. So under here, you saw what I did under here. This has got a nice divot in it. If you wanted to, you could just do a, put a little subtle shape in there if you wanted to. You could sand that, you could put on a Dremel, a belt sander. I'll show you a one way you can do like a little detail. Um, let me see, where is, where is that? I don't know where it is. 
So where is it? Okay, you know what? I have an idea. I'm gonna do it in a slightly different way than I was originally thinking. Um, just to be fancy, for the sake of being fancy, we're gonna do this. I'm going to get this exhaust pipe that I use for metalworking. I'm going to put it in my clamp, my vise. And we are going to take some sandpaper and we're going to put it onto the pipe. And we're going to do this. I'm going to take this, I'm going to turn it sideways, kind of hold it in the middle of the, the pipe. So we've got one side. I'm gonna do the other side here. I'm gonna help myself out here and do this. Let that hold the sandpaper for me too. Get in there. <sighs> Almost there. Sometimes the sandpaper where you're sanding gets like infested with sand uh, sawdust. And so you might need to rotate the sandpaper just to kind of get a fresh section. You can do this with a dowel too. If you have a big thick like closet dowel rod, pull off your closet, put it in a clamp. You can do it with a cardboard tube with sandpaper that's glued onto it. I've done that where I put it on a cardboard tube, glued it on, and then use the tube and put this on the table and use the tube to sand it. Um, any kind of shape that you can hold the sandpaper onto and go over it or rub the shape onto it, you can do the same method with. Pretty close. So now I'm actually rotating it back and forth and doing that round, rounding motion. I've discovered that helps me bevel the edges and concave shapes. So I'm just turning it back and forth, going in circles to get that bevel. And again, if I was holding this, I would just be rubbing it or doing it with my other arm instead of the piece. Little things will make all the difference. Like, it doesn't seem like 
maybe this little arch is going to matter. But you'll be proud of it. And when other people notice it, they'll go, oh my gosh, that looks so real. That's the effect I always go for. I like to be happy with what I did, and I like surprising other people and seeing them surprised and knowing they're having fun, enjoying what I made. So these little types of things add to that. But if you don't want to do that, you don't have to do it. It's okay. Hello! Had to do it, sorry. So there is our little curve arch thing. Thing of a bobber. Thing of a beamy. Shoo to do. Okay, and you can refine this, of course. You might have to refine it a little bit. Mine is that's pretty good. It could use a little bit of fine sanding. What I'll probably do when everything's glued up at the end is I will take uh, like a small piece of 220 grit sandpaper in my hand and I'll just go with my hand on this um, once it's all glued up. So why don't we do that? Glue it up, glue it up. And for this, I'm gonna get my one, two, three blocks to help me hold it in place. Ah. So I'm gonna use these to hold this. And then I'm gonna use these on the ends to hold this. So let me see if I can give you guys a good angle here. A more interesting angle. There we go. What's up everybody that's coming in? All right, I'm gonna glue this piece in first. And again, you don't have to make it this fancy. This isn't even that fancy. It's just kind of a, a little step up. If you wanna keep it super simple, you don't have to cut these a smaller width. You don't have to cut one of these. You can just do the two legs and be done with it. You don't have to do none of that. It is your little world, and you make it how you want, and that is the truth. It's your little escape. Do what makes you happy. Okay, same thing here. I'm just gonna put a little bit of glue where that's gonna join, and some more here. And we're gonna put this here, and I'm gonna put a one, two, three block there to make sure that it is square to the top of it. That, putting this on there is gonna make sure that this doesn't, the leg doesn't tip one way or the other. So I'm just going to hold this, press, I'm holding this piece, pressing this piece, make sure it's nice and straight. And then I'm making sure this is parallel to this line over here. I'm just kind of visually aligning everything here to make sure it looks as nice as I can get it. So I don't have to rip it apart and change it later. Okay. Again, when you're doing this, uh, it's important to think which faces you want out as well. Like this face to me is more interesting than this face. So I want to face the more interesting face outward so that when it gets flipped over, the most interesting looking thing is facing outward. Or if I don't want that, maybe I want it to look very plain and simple because I want it to have a certain vibe, flip that side out, right? For this case, I want that, that side out just to kind of match the style of my table, which has these two tones on it. So if I choose to stain it or, or like clear coat it, uh, it will have a, a carryover vibe of style. Um, it'll have a, a harmonious, harmoniousness of harmonium. I can't think of the word for that. You know what I mean. <laughs> it's going to be cohesive. That's the word. I couldn't think of cohesive. Came to me in a dream just now. Okay. That is going to go there. We're going to do the same thing. Put this here. Push this. I'm going to hold this now. This one, two, three block. And I'm going to push on this one. Make sure it's where it needs to be. And then I'm going to just make sure this is nice and parallel with this one, which it looks pretty close already. So these are parallel, these are parallel, these are pushed up to each other. 
If I leave this here for like 10 minutes, I can pick it. I can take these all off and flip it over, but I'm probably just going to leave that like it is overnight. So let's check on the table. Let's see how dry it is. See if I can fiddle with the legs or if I need to wait a little bit longer. Might need to wait. Scraps. One, two, three blocks make great pencil holders too. Okay, let's unclamp this and see how it's doing. So, pretty good. This ended up a little bit off kilter, but that is okay. This side is nice and square. So somehow, in all my pushing and pulling, it ended up a slightly bit off kilter, but that's gonna be not visible. It's from this corner, it's gonna look nice. From this corner, it's gonna look nice. So it's not gonna matter in the end. So I think, yeah, we're good. Everything's, nothing's gonna budge. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull the tape. Oops, as I mess up my bench, I'm gonna pull the tape. And I'm gonna hold these in place while I pull the tape, just in case they wanna let go. I don't want to encourage them to let go. I want them to stay. Don't. Let go, you got the glue in you. Bleep, bleep, bleep. So there's our pretty little tabletop. There's our like little stylized edge, which I'll refine more as we go. Like I said, I just did the initial bulk sanding down and shaping. So these are la legs. So what I was gonna do is just glue them right in here in this pocket, in this, sorry, it's out of focus, sorry, in this corner. But we could glue them straight onto the corner. We could set them back. We could notch them out. That would be interesting too. We could do that. Maybe we'll try that. Why don't we try that really quick? How much of a pain in the butt is that gonna be? Shouldn't be too big of a pain in the butt. Let's get fancy, why not? Don't you blah da dee da be da da do. So I'll put a pencil mark here. Pencil mark here. So I know where to trim. Okay. Then I can yourself there's a million ways you could do this method as well I'm just doing this See if I like it. If I don't, I'll just cut another leg. And I can sand it a little bit. So I cut that so I could do this. So I'll make sure that's at the right height. Yep, okay. So now I can cut back on the whole thing and get it to go in there. That is the correct height. Now I need to cut off a pretty big chunk of this. So this is gonna require a Mitre box so that I don't hurt myself. Actually, I'm gonna slide this whole apparatus over. Cut to that depth that I penciled in. See that? I just cut to that depth up there. I'm gonna do the same thing up here. We're getting fancy in here. Oops, got the wrong part. Haha. <laughs> Wouldn't be oiler if I didn't cut it wrong. Whoops. That's okay. Cut 
that in the wrong place like a doofus. Okay. Probably gonna have to cut a new leg. Oops. That's what I get for trying to be fancy. Yeah, see, I should have cut this and this and I cut that. <laughs> Oops. Well, learn from my mistakes, children. There we go. It might work. I could just use glue to keep it together. I could cheat. I could cheat. If it'll let me, probably won't. Trying to do this without breaking a little piece off. I would be a little more aggressive if I wasn't trying to break this little piece off, but it probably is going to break anyways. That's what I needed to do, but I accidentally cut over here. Dope! Okay, so see with that notch out, we can do this. We can get that in there like that, and then we can do it like a face to face uh, grain join. So when you join face to face, it's a lot stronger. Instead of end to end or end to face, if you go face to face, because that's face grain now, that's face grain, that's face grain, that's face grain. I could probably just glue this up and it'll solve itself. But I don't know if I want to be that lazy. Let me just see if I can shave this a little bit, <sighs> refine that a little bit careful for doing this. See how my thumb is below the knife? Let's have a really tight grip on this too, so even if it slips, it's not going to move very far. Extremely light pressure here. I'm only doing that to see if I can get this to fit. <laughs> the next one won't be that dangerous. I think I can make it work. And just fill it in. If I don't break this off while sanding it. Watch Euler fix his mistakes live. I come for the instruction that I stay for the mistakes. See how fragile that is? But once I glue all this together, it'll be very strong. <clears throat> let me see if it'll let me do this. Nope, it broke. Okay. Well, you get the idea. Let me try it again, sorry. <laughs> now I gotta do it. I gotta make it work. I need my depth first, don't I? Depth. Depth of cut. Okay, so see now, I did not cut this corner. That's what I was trying to do. So now, it's still a little cut, but it's gonna be okay. So now I can actually do this proper. There we go. That's what I meant to do. See, it's a lot faster if you do it right. So now I can glue that in and we'll get a nice, much tighter fit. Look at that, look how pretty that is. All I had to do was mess up a little bit. Just like you will, like me, like all of us, it's normal. Okay, I'm gonna glue this together. I'm just gonna squish a bunch of glue into there like that. And kind of smear it around. And 
Which again, once again, apologizing to the master woodworkers that are watching this, because I know that's what they come here for. The entertainment. And I'm just going to push this into that corner. Wipe off the excess. I'm going to put a one, two, three block in there to line it up with everything with the universe. Okay, and then I'm going to use a rubber band. No, I'm not. That's not gonna work, sorry. I need another one over here. I've done that before, but not that way. I guess I'll just leave it. Yep. Okay, there we go. That'll stay where it is, that'll dry. So um, I'll be able to move that in about 10 minutes um, and I could do the other ones the same way, like one at a time. But, um, Normally I would do all four and put like two, one, two, three blocks and some clamps or a big rubber band or something like that around it um, to hold it. But since I'm doing this like sort of miter, or not more miter, but uh, mortise and tenon sort of looking joinery there, which will be stronger in the end when it glues up too and look prettier. Um, yeah, that's what we'll do. So I have to let this dry before I move on to that one and let that dry before I do anything else. So... Flip the camera. I bet you wanted that view, didn't you? Um, let me get a wipe. Hold on a sec. Well, I have a microfiber cloth right here. There we go. Hello, everybody. Okay, so we are <laughs> two hours and 36 minutes in. So um, I think I'm going to leave this stream there and I will pick up with you guys next week. I'm going to do three more table legs like the one you just watched me do. Um, and then I'm going to um, sand the bottom of those legs. Like I said, once they're all glued in place, I'm going to flip them and sand them so that they're actually level to each other. And then we will pick up next week with making a chair and staining and or painting. Maybe both. Maybe we'll do maybe we'll do a paint as a stain. You can do that. Yes, I'll show you how. Um, I've done that many times. It's actually how I color my miniature palettes. I use a paint as a stain to get it to look the way I like. So, anyways, you guys are awesome. Thank you for watching. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all the likes. 62 likes is incredible. Where that was, a, I think that's approaching one of my previous records. So, thank you. Um, and uh, if any of you in the future times have any questions, please ask them. Or any complaints or any suggestions, please. Uh, if you know way more than I do about woodworking or what I could have done better or differently, please comment. Uh, myself and all of the channel members and subscribers would love to see those comments. Any help that you're willing to share is appreciated because that's what we're doing here. We're just sharing it all. A big old bonfire of sharing it all. Sharing it. I can't think of any other acronyms aside from sharing. Anyways, <laughs> be kind to each other. Be careful. Be safe. Have a good year. Be calm. I appreciate you guys. I'm kind of tired. But I'm glad you enjoyed it, Michael. Thank you guys, everybody, everybody for being here. Everybody that commented. I know I didn't interact with them as much with the chat because I knew I kind of need to focus on what I was doing. But uh, I will interact with future comments. And uh, we'll see you later.